Hello out there. Let me welcome you to Inches Church's worship service for the 14th of June, 2020. Uh, whether you're normally uh, used to coming to church or uh, have just been plugging into these online services, uh, we do hope through the prayers, Bible reading, songs and the talks, uh, you will be led into the presence of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, uh, and find yourself worshipping him from your heart. Uh, in our service today, we'll be singing uh, quite an array of songs, uh, an unaccompanied psalm, a rap, and a modern hymn. But all of them are glorifying God. All of them are rejoicing in his wonderful salvation. Uh, God calls us to join together to praise him, whatever our musical tastes. The word says, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Uh, so let's do that now. Uh, we're going to go back to the psalm we began our service with last week, Psalm 130. Uh, and this time we'll be singing uh, the Sing Psalms version, uh, led by St. Peter's Free Church, Dundee. So let us sing Psalm 130, Lord, from the depths I call to you. Lord, from the depths I Let us now come to God, our Heavenly Father, in prayer. Let us pray. Who can stand if you our sins record, but yet forgiveness is with you, that we may fear you, Lord. Everlasting Creator, Heavenly Father, may your name be adored by all whom you have made. May all your purposes come to pass on this planet. We look at the beauty all around us, the trees, the birds, the animals, the mountains and sky, and we see the hand of a master designer, a craftsman. It's amazing that when you sent your son to earth 
You sent him as a craftsman into a carpenter's family. But he was to build more than tables and chairs, for you sent him to build your kingdom here, to bear the sins of many. Oh, we rejoice that Jesus did not fail, that he didn't look at us and turn away in disgust. We give thanks that he accomplished the work you gave him to do and said on the cross, it is finished. And so we kneel before the wonder of the cross again today. Show us its power. That the Lord Jesus became sin for us. That our debts were paid, our sins forgiven. Show us the terrible nature of our sins that would cause you to be made a curse to pardon us. Oh Lord Jesus, show us the enormity of our guilt as we remember the crown of thorns, the pierced hands and feet, the bruised body, the dying cries. It's because of the riches of your grace, your abundant mercy, your love, that you didn't run from the cross. You willingly bore the wrath of God, gave your life so that we could be forgiven. We marvel at this invitation to come and to find refuge and safety in you. Jesus, we thank you for the good news and that by it, through it, we can be changed by your grace. May your salvation change the way we are living. May what you have done radically impact what we do. Our Heavenly Father, would you bless this time of worship through your word and by your spirit would those who have not yet received Christ as Saviour seek refuge and salvation in him? And would those of us who have experienced your saving grace and love, would we be urged, pushed on to live in a manner worthy of the gospel? Show us, equip us, change us. And hear us now as we pray together Say the words Jesus taught his followers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it's Truth Trackers time. Hi, boys and girls. Uh, after Finley and Archie's Moses video last week, Catherine Lena sent in a video she made. It's um, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. So let's take a wee look at it now. Now it's time for a true Bible story. Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge road kept flowing wherever he went because he saw some miraculous signs as he had healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was the only time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look. For him, turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew Simon's Peter's brother spoke up, There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that? 
with this huge crowd. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and divided them to the people. Afterward, he did eat the same with the fish. Nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces. With scraps left by the people who have eaten from the five barley loaves. Wow, that was great reading and a good use of Lego there, Catherine Lena. What, what a miracle Jesus did there, feeding all those people. So powerful and so kind. Well, we'll put that video and also uh, the Moses video and the Samson ones, we'll put them up on uh, the Interest Church Facebook page so you can have a look at them all there. Uh, the challenge isn't over yet though, boys and girls. You can still send in a wee video uh, just telling us who your favorite Bible character is or, uh, like you've seen, telling a Bible story. So we look forward uh, to, to getting those from you. Now, last week I sneaked out of my office and I had a wee stroll around the garden looking at the squirrels and the blue chicks. Uh, hopefully you remember that. And we were just thinking about uh, how we must trust and we must ask God to look after us every day. So I'm just wondering, do you think I should escape from my office again this week? Yeah? You think I should? Okay. Or would you like to come? Yeah, you can come too. Come on. Well, I wanted to show you our hens this week. I've always loved hens. Uh, they're actually good pets. Uh, one of the coolest things about them is they uh, can lay you breakfast. There you go. Every morning. But you have to cook them, of course. Um, I'll leave that in there for now. Um, so let me just feed them some barley here. See them come running. Uh, these are our little chickens. Very, very good and uh, very friendly actually. You can just pick them up. Oh, it wants to get down so it can eat its barley. Uh, I'll let it crack on with its snack there. Uh, but I want to tell you a story about uh, a hen uh, because hens are actually really good mothers. Uh, we don't have any chicks here. At the moment, uh, you need a cockerel for that, but that's a whole uh, other discussion. Uh, but like the blue tits uh, from last week, the parents uh, uh, of the blue tits were so good. And uh, hens are really good parents too. So let me tell you the story. One day there was a fire on a farm and a huge barn burnt down. Uh, fortunately, the farmer uh, sent all the animals out. He managed to release them all and they all ran into the field away from the fire. When the fire was over, uh, the, the farmer gathered all the animals back and uh, he counted them all and they were all there except for one hen, one white hen and her nine chicks. Where could they have gone? The chicks were very young. Uh, they were little fluffy, soft balls of, of yellow down. And uh, the farmer had seen them when the fire was raging, running uh, after the mother hen towards the safety of the open field. And she was an excellent mother. So where could they be? So the farmer went to the opening in the wall that led out to the, the safety of the field. Uh, it was near the burned out uh, barn. And there he stopped and he stared at the ground. The hen sat in a heap, just a meter, just a wee bit away from the gap in the wall. Her head was hanging over on one side and her feathers were scorched with fire. 
she was dead. And yet the path to safety lay in front of her. The way was open. Why had she just sat down and died right there? The farmer stopped and sadly stooped down, picked her up. And out from under her wings ran nine fluffy chicks, alive and chirping. Amazing. He gathered them all up, put them in a, a box with a blanket and put them near the stove in the kitchen to keep warm. And his daughter said, Dad, she could have easily saved herself, couldn't she? But I suppose that the chicks, they were too small to run fast. Or, or perhaps they couldn't see their way in the smoke or, or they were going the wrong way. And she knew the safest place was under her wings. Didn't she, Daddy? The daughter said. I, I suppose she just sat down, called them to come and then died instead of them. What a loving mother hen, the daughter said. The way was open. The hen could have saved herself. And yet if she'd done that, she would have left her little ones lost in the smoke behind. She loved them too much to do that. I think that's a great story. And it reminds me of the amazing true story. The most incredible story. We call it the gospel or the good news. Uh, and it's what Jesus has done, what he did for us. You see, Jesus was sinless. Uh, the way was open for him to go back to heaven without needing to die. But if he had done that, we would have remained cut off from God. We would not have been able to find our way back to God uh, without him. If he had gone uh, without dying on the cross, there would be no way back for us to God and to life because our sin would still be on us. And that separates us from God. Uh, and, and that means we're separated from eternal life. So Jesus chose because he loves us so much. He chose to hang on the cross and to die instead of us and calling us to come to him, come to the safest place so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have life eternal. What amazing love. You know, the Bible says, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, later in the service, uh, David is uh, going to be thinking about uh, if we've been saved and forgiven, how should we then live our lives? And the simple answer is by loving and forgiving others. And this uh, new song we're going to sing now, uh, it's, it's all about that. It says, if we've been forgiven, it's got to change the way we're living. Uh, so after the song, you're welcome to click on the link to our new fun series uh, from out of the box called Honky and Trek. Uh, but now let's sing our new song, Lord, help us forgive. Yeah, blessed are those whose sins are forgiven. Once had a servant who owed him a huge debt But the king forgave the servant, sent him home And yet, when the friend who owed the servant a debt that was so small He begged the servant for mercy, but he got none at all The king heard all about it, and was he ever mad? He sent the servant to prison and took away all he had Said he had to stay in there till he could pay it all back Cause the servant was forgiven, but forgiveness was what he lacked Our debt was satisfied On the cross when Jesus died and if we've been forgiven, it's got to change the way Father, we're living. How can we hold a grudge? No. How can we fail to love? Once we have no more mercy is, Lord, help us Lord, forgive. Help us forgive. Father, help us. Now Peter came to Jesus. 
Jesus because he was so confused. If my brother keeps on sinning against me, what should I do? I'm trying to be patient. I'm trying to be kind. Do I have to forgive him the same thing seven times? Our sins were countless like the sand on the shore. We should be grateful that the Lord, he's not keeping the score. No, his love erased them. They washed away when he hung and died on the cross and paid the pavement. Our debt was satisfied On the cross when Jesus died And if we've been forgiven yes. It's gotta change the way we're living How can we hold a grudge? How can we, hold How can we fail to love? Once we have known what mercy is Lord help us forgive It can be hard to forgive There's no pretending down for some 12 weeks or more. And over the last week or two, as I've spoken to some of you on the telephone, I have sensed a growing weariness. 12 weeks is a long time. And it seems that some form of lockdown, for some of us anyway, is likely to continue into the foreseeable future. The Lord knows and understands as we walk through these dark and difficult days. But in his word, we can find encouragement. And we find in the words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 11 and 28, we find these words. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So let us come to him, because from him we can receive strength for our weakness, peace for our fears, trust for our doubts, and above all, rest for our weariness. So let us come to the throne of grace. Let us come humbly before Almighty God, and let us bring our prayers of intercession to him. Let us pray. Almighty God, El Shaddai, we come this morning to worship and adore you. We are living through dark and uncertain times, such as we would not have imagined even six months ago. Nations closed off, families exiled from each other, airlines grounded, and planet Earth brought to a virtual standstill through a minute, unseen, viral enemy. Father, we lift to you the families throughout the world who have lost loved ones to this virus and who are mourning today. We remember especially those living in poverty, those in refugee camps, crowded together and without adequate food and sanitation and washing facilities. The Rohingya people in Bangladesh, those in Jordan and Syria and Turkey, the crowded cities of India and Pakistan. Lord, we pray for their protection from the coronavirus and COVID-19. We pray too for those living in the path of this great plague of locusts across Africa, Iraq, Iran, India and Pakistan, 
where crops are being decimated and where famine will inevitably follow. Father, we thank you for all who have been instrumental in saving lives and in containing the pandemic. The NHS workers, doctors, surgeons, anaesthetists, nurses and all ancillary staff, the GPs, the ambulance crews, social workers and care home staff as they work to save lives, to bring comfort and support and, where necessary, to be with the dying. We pray you will supply their every need, giving them the skills, wisdom and compassion for the moment. Lord, we pray for continuing containment of this pandemic. We pray for teachers and all working in education, whether in field, in schools or colleges or universities as they seek a way forward to bring our children and young people safely back into full-time education. We ask that you will give them wisdom and discernment in all their decisions and a unity of purpose. We remember especially the hubs at Milburn Academy, Drakey School and the IRA, where volunteers are caring for the children of frontline workers and for vulnerable children. Please keep them protected from infection. And in this context, we remember Caroline White and her school, and we give thanks for answered prayer. We pray for all serving in the police force as they seek to maintain social distancing in our communities, and especially in the recent situations of civil unrest. We ask your protection upon them in these difficult times. We pray for our leaders in government, in Westminster, in Holyrood, in Wales and in Northern Ireland, and for our Highland Council here in Inverness. May they exercise caution in all their decisions and take cognizance of the scientific and medical advice given. We remember those of our own congregation who are battling health issues and loss at this present time. We pray again for Nan Fraser's brother. We lift to you our brother Bernie Robertson as he grieves the loss of his son Scott, remembering his wife Jackie and their daughter Melissa. And we pray for the whole Grigger family in the recent death of Hector. We give thanks for successful outcome of surgery for Rona Cruikshank, who fell and fractured her hip last Sunday. And we continue to pray for Trish, that she may have peace of mind and relief of pain. Through all our changed circumstances, Lord, you have given us a precious gift of time, replacing our many hours of busyness. Time to assess our lives, to reassess our priorities, to repair broken friendships and relationships to seek forgiveness for past wrongs and hurts to others, to devote more time to prayer and study of the scriptures, to appreciate the wonders of creation and new life, to meditate on the meaning of life and to prepare for life's end. For we were created from the dust of the earth and the dust will return to the ground whence it came and the spirit to God who gave it. Lord, we thank you for this precious time you have given us. May we not waste it, but rather use it to bring glory to you. All these are prayers we bring to you today. We leave them with you in the belief and in the faith that you hear our cries for help, that in your great mercy and compassion you will answer them. For Jesus' sake, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen.
We're continuing to look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and particularly his teaching on prayer. And in that context, we've been reading through what we've come to know as the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to look again at something in that today. And so it's Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7 that we're reading from. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And when you pray... Do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And then because we're going to be thinking about the subject of forgiveness. I wanted to read a parable that Jesus tells in response to a question from Peter. So it's Matthew 18 and 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not even seven times, but 77 times. And therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. The servant fell to his knees, begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Steady went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. Do you remember when lockdown started and there was an awful lot of panic buying and people obviously then had a list of stuff that they thought they might need if they were to be shut in for a long time? I wonder, did you make a list? What was on your list? What was on your list of needs, must-haves? Or let me just broaden that question for a moment. Let's not think so much about life under lockdown. Let's just think about life more generally. If I asked you to draw up a list of human, basic, essential human needs, what would be on your list? Clothing? Food? Money? A roof over your head, someone to love and to love you, a a meaning, a purpose in life, freedom? What would be on your list? What would you say? And I ask that because it struck me actually just in preparing this and in reading again through what Jesus says here, struck me that what Jesus is doing here is he's highlighting what he regards as basic human needs. 
you heard that warning of to his disciples, you know, don't babble on, don't don't pray in lots of words as if you're going to be heard by the volume of your words. He says, no, no, your heavenly Father knows your need before you ask him. And so he says, pray like this, and he teaches them what we've come to know as the Lord Prayer, Lord's Prayer. And by implication, he spells out in that prayer what he considers to be basic human needs, essential human needs, daily needs. And you would have heard, as we saw last week, material, physical provisions in there. That's what uh, give us this day our daily bread is all about. But now he includes in that list, as it were, forgiveness. We are to ask for forgiveness. That, for Jesus, is a basic human need. We need to be forgiven. We need to be forgiving. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And just in case we missed it, you may have noticed how he kind of fills that out a little later in 14 and 15. Because if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now let me ask you, I wonder if forgiveness made your list of basic, essential, everyday human needs. To be forgiven and forgiving. Why does Jesus put this here? That's what we want to think about. Now, in that regard, I have a confession. I actually need to ask your forgiveness, or at least I need to ask your indulgence, your patience, because originally I had intended to deal with forgiven and forgiving in one sermon. But the more I looked at this, read, I find I had so much material. And actually, I realized that this whole subject of being forgiven, particularly, is so central to the biblical story and to the Christian message that I thought it was worth focusing the whole of this sermon on it. And then next week, God willing, we'll look at um, about the call to being forgiving. So this is forgiven and forgiving part one and part two, hopefully, will be next week. But if forgiveness wouldn't have made your list of basic essential human needs, why not? Well, I can imagine somebody saying something like this. Well, you know, I know, I know I'm not perfect. I, I admit I have my flaws sometimes on a bad day. I, I'm a bit sharp with my wife, my children, my cat. And I say sorry, but I would never really harm anyone. Forgiveness as an essential human daily need, that makes me sound like a terrible person. Well, just think about what it is that Jesus tells us to ask forgiveness for. Did you hear the language? Forgive us our debts. Now, that's a significant word, debts. It's a word, of course, that originally had to do with financial obligation. You know, you hadn't paid your bill, you were in debt. And you had an obligation, a legal obligation to settle that debt, to pay it. And Jesus then is using that word, taking that word here to express not financial obligation, but moral obligation. We have moral obligations implicit in this. We have moral obligations that we have failed to meet. We have debts. To whom? To God. And in using that word, Jesus is telling us, I think, something about the essential nature of what the Bible calls sin. You know, go back to that protest about why we wouldn't place forgiveness as a basic human need. You know, something like, okay, I'm not perfect, but I wouldn't harm anyone. I, I try to be a good mum, a good neighbour. I pay my taxes. I, I usually stick to the speed limits. What's the problem with that line of arguing? What's the underlying problem? Well, the Bible says there is an underlying problem. Do you, do you know the story of the man who was a really good sailor? 
never late for his duty, always kept awake, especially when it was his job to be the lookout. He never fell asleep. He helped his shipmates. He watched out for them. He, he filled in for them when they were sick. He, he always followed orders. He was always respectful to his captain. He always did exactly what his captain told him. He was a faultless sailor. That's great, we see, isn't it? But it wasn't great. He wasn't great. And do you know why? Because he sailed under the skull and crossbones. Because he was a pirate. He was sailing under the wrong flag. He was serving under the wrong captain. He was sailing under a rebel flag. He didn't recognise or submit to legitimate authority. And actually, his being a good sailor was his biggest problem because by being a good sailor, he was advancing the cause of piracy, which is not good, which is never good. He was being good, but in the wrong cause for the wrong captain under a rebel flag. And that is what sin is. It's, it's living life, no matter how we live it, under a rebel flag. It's failing to recognise legitimate authority, God's authority. Or to put it another way, sin is about acting as if we were God, as if we were in charge. And that, according to the Bible, the book of Genesis, is what happened right at the beginning in the Garden of Eden when we as a human race decided that we wanted to be God. We, we, we didn't want creaturely status. No, we wanted to be God. We wanted to live accordingly. Living as if we're God. You ever done that? I mean, you ever find yourself reading the Bible and you want to rewrite bits of it? You know, so somebody says, you know, the Bible's teaching that sex outside of marriage is wrong. I, I can't have that. I would change that. Or that teaching about loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you, turning the other cheek. No, no, can't have that. Take it out. And people have done that. But what are we doing when we want to do that? When we do that, we're saying, I don't just want to break the rules. I want to make the rules. I want to be God. I want to decide what's right and wrong for me. I want to be God. And listen, at different times we've all done that. And in so doing, we've failed to give God his proper place. We've failed to recognise his legitimate authority over us as our maker to tell us how to live. We owe him. He gave us life. He sustains us in life. But we fail to give him his due and therefore we are constantly in debt to him. But again, just think further on this. I mean, take something that's been in the news so much recently. Take, take the Black Lives Matter campaign, which of course they do. But have you ever thought, where does that idea come from? Indeed, where does that idea that all human life, all human beings matter, whatever their colour, their gender, their age, their ability? Well, it doesn't come from evolutionary thought. It's not a logical conclusion from atheistic, secular, from an atheistic, secular worldview. That, now, that doesn't mean that people who believe in evolution or are secular or atheistic can't hold to such a position or practice it. Clearly, many do, but it's not a logical conclusion of evolutionary and atheistic, secular beliefs. No. The idea that black lives matter, the idea that every human life matters, that comes from the Bible. Again, it's from the book of Genesis in the first place, that every human being is made in the image of God, made in his own image by God and for God. But then that's what we've rejected. That's what we've failed to live up to. No, we say, no, no, my life is mine. To live as I please. 
we've not given God his due place. We've not honoured him, obeyed him as we should. We've not, as Jesus says elsewhere, we've not kept that first, what he calls the first commandment. We've not loved God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind. We've not loved our neighbour as ourselves. And so we stand before God with a mountain of moral debt which we can never repay. But that's not all. In all of this, we've not done ourselves any favours either. Why not? Well, again, think about this. If, if tomorrow you get a parcel from Amazon and you open up and there's a mobile phone in there, how do you decide if it's a good mobile phone? Well, it's no good for hammering nails into a wall, is it? It's no good for flipping over the pancakes that you're trying to make in your frying pan. But then you say, well, no, of course it's not good for these things because it was never intended for these things. And that's right. What determines whether something is good is whether it's used for the purpose for which it was made. That's what determines a good mobile phone. Does it fulfill the purpose for which it was made? And that principle applies to all things. That principle applies to our life. So what was the purpose of human life? Well, again, the Bible says clearly human life was made by God in his image for God to know him, to love him, to trust him, to obey him, to glorify him, to enjoy him. And that means that we will never know true goodness. We will never know true satisfaction in life until we come to find again and begin to fulfill that purpose for which we were made, for which we were intended. And that's why forgiveness is so needed. We need to be forgiven by God so that our relationship with him, to whom we owe everything, may be repaired and we ourselves can begin to be restored to the good and the true purpose of human life. So we can begin to sail under the right flag, God's flag, as his children. And so forgiveness is needed. But then we say, well, how can God forgive? And if we're tempted to say, well, that, surely that's a straightforward matter. We, we say, sorry, he forgives. Well, the Bible and Jesus himself, not only in his teaching, but especially in his life and particularly in his death, would tell us otherwise. But I think actually our own experience would tell us otherwise. Forgiveness, wherever it's needed, is never easy, is it? It's never without cost. Now, we'll think more about this next week when we consider Jesus' call to be forgiving. But suffice to say at this stage, you know, when somebody has really hurt us and we, we've got to do something with the pain of the offence that's been committed against us the damage that's been done to us and often our response, we want to inflict that pain back. We want to retaliate or at least we want to seek some kind of reparation for the pain, the damage to us. We would say that's just. Or if we are going to forgive, we've somehow to absorb that pain, the cost of that damage, we've got to absorb it within ourselves. But there is pain, isn't there? There is damage and somebody has to pay the cost of it. Forgiveness is not easy and it's never without cost. And when it comes to God, one of the questions that the Bible implicitly raises for us, is, as somebody's expressed it, is this. How can someone who is truly good, God, forgive what is truly bad, our sins, all this moral debt that we owe, without, how can someone who's truly good forgive what is truly bad without morally compromising himself? And that is a vital question because 
Our sins, our debts are serious. They are truly bad. I mean, God himself makes that plain at the beginning when in Genesis 2, he warned the first human beings of the consequences of our usurping his place, of living as if he were God. He said to them, on the day of your disobedience, you will die. Death was the punishment. Death was the just consequence of such sin, physical death, but more significantly spiritual death, separation from God in this life and that to come. Divine justice demands that the debt that we owe is paid. God can't pass over it as if it hadn't happened, as if there was no offence. And we as soiled and spoiled human beings are in no position to pay for it. And that's exactly why Jesus, who speaks here of the need of forgiveness, would later, as the Son of God would later explain to his disciples in Matthew 16 and 21, why his death, his suffering on the cross was necessary and why when uh, then on the night before he died, he would, meeting with his disciples, he would take a cup of wine for them to drink and he would say, Matthew 26, 28, this cup represents my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. For what? For the forgiveness of sins. My death, he's saying, represented by this cup of wine, my blood poured out in death, that will be for the forgiveness of sins. And if you wonder, well, how does that work? Then Paul explains as he writes to the Colossians later, Colossians 2 and 14. He speaks of God cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This is just the most amazing truth that God, the triune God, out of his full and free love, in his just mercy, he absorbed the debt that he had run, that we had run up with him and all its consequences. God the Father took the record of our debt that mountain of moral debt with all its legal demands and Jesus the Son willingly paid for it all in full. It was laid on him. There's an old chorus which expresses it this way, speaking of Jesus, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away and now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, the whole day long, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. That's what was going on in the cross. Or or listen to the words of John Stott. He said, the essence of human sin is man substituting himself for God while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man on the cross. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be, but God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives which belong to God alone. God accepts penalties which belong to man alone. That's how forgiveness comes. That's the basis, the only basis. But it's a sure basis on which we may ask and receive, be sure of receiving forgiveness. We we trust our lives to Jesus who took the record of our debt and paid for it in full when he died on that cross and then gives to us in return the record of his perfect obedience. I wonder if you've received that forgiveness. You know, John White in his book, The Masks 
of melancholy. He writes about a psychiatric patient he once had. This man was 40 years, he was a bachelor who against all medical evidence was convinced that he, had, he was dying of cancer. And when White started to talk to the man, he discovered that the man had two past sins that he was extremely troubled about. The first was that he had drunk a bottle of beer many years before when his doctor had told him not to. And the second and more significant was that he had avoided enlisting for, the, for World War II in which he felt bad about that because a number of his friends had been killed in that conflict. And knowing that this man was in fact a Christian believer, White asked him whether he believed in forgiveness. Oh yes, he replied, because Christ died, he shed blood. Well, so what about your sins? John White asked him. No, no, I, I'm too bad, he responded. I, I don't deserve ever to be forgiven. John White says, unaccountably, I grew angry. angry. There was no logical reason for it. What do you mean you're too bad, I asked him. And his voice rising like my own, well, I don't deserve ever to be forgiven. You're darn right you don't, said John White. And he looked at White surprised. I can't be a hypocrite. I've got to make amends. And John White says it may be hard to, to believe, but I just found my anger increasing. And who do you think that you are to say that Christ's death was not enough for you? Who are you to feel that you must add your miserable pittance to the great gift that God offers you? Is his sacrifice not good enough for the likes of you? And at that moment, says White, we just stood staring at each other and suddenly he began to cry and pray at once. I didn't know. I'm really sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. And a few days later, he came back to John White and he said, Doc, I know you're busy, but I've got to talk to you. I don't know to, how to say it, but it's like I've been blind all my life. And now, well, now, now I can see. He'd seen his need of forgiveness, but more particularly, he'd seen how Jesus' death met that forgiveness and he'd received it. Have you done that? He died that we might be forgiven, that our debt might be cancelled, that we can always go to God the Father in his name and say to him, forgive us our debts, and he will forgive. Trusting him, trusting Jesus, we stand forgiven at the cross. Let's pray together. Father, help us, we pray, to see ourselves as we are before you, to see our need of forgiveness. But help us, as soon as we see that, to be able to see that Jesus, by his death in our place for our sins, has met that need, that you have laid on him the record of our debt, and he has paid in full for it. And thank you then for that promise that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. May we know the joy, the liberty, the freedom of sins forgiven and live in fellowship and friendship with yourself through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, again, thanks for being with us. If you want to think a little more about what is such an important subject, there's a couple of questions at the end just to ponder, maybe to discuss, and we'll be thinking about them in home groups uh, this week as well. And if you can come back next week, then again, we'll be thinking about Jesus' call for ourselves to be forgiving. But in the meantime, let's uh, conclude by singing these wonderful words that again further remind us of the power of the cross of Jesus. Oh,
you see the dawn of the darkest day? Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.